The following podcast may contain some adult language. You've been warned. Those of you who got an invite, welcome to Nerd Prom. <laughs> no matter where in the world you are, we're all Nerds International with the hyphen. Welcome to Finding the Narrative, a Genesis RPG podcast. This is a show dedicated to the Genesis role-playing system from Fantasy Flight Games, a show in which we, your hosts, discuss all things Genesis from both a player's and a GM's perspective. I am Tony Fanning, and with me, as always, is my good friend and co-host, Chris Holmes. How you doing, homie? <laughs> I, dude, like I said earlier, I'm doing great. Of course, it's Sunday. Yeah, we record on Sunday. Vikings win today. My Michigan Wolverines won yesterday, and I'm glad you don't really care about um, college football and you're not a state fan. <laughs> so we would have to cancel the Wait, wait, wait. In case no, my dad's kidding. listening. In case my dad's listening. Yes, I'm a state fan, Dad. <laughs> nice. <laughs> no, anyways, um, yeah, it was, uh, it, was a, ooh, it was a good weekend of gaming, too. My buddy um, Kyle ran us through our high-level D&D on Friday night in which... My halfling barbarian got intellectually devoured, <laughs> which is always fun. You got hit by an in- intellect devourer? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I completely failed. He took Oy. me over. He ended up killing my character, but then we had the Morden intervention, and then it was a roll between my buddy and I, D20s, rolling that high, higher in D20. I'm like, all right. Let's do it because, dude, he rolls crap all the time. Sorry, Kyle, if you if you you do know this, and he did this challenge because he wanted to tr- he wanted to put in a situation where he's give me shit for probably the rest of my life if I lost this roll. Of course, he rolls a one, and I'm like, ah, oh, and I rolled and I rolled a three. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> he had a chance; door was open, <laughs> but I still rolled higher, higher than. Oh, that's dude. Great. I'm telling you, it's uncanny. He does well in like OSR games because you got to roll low. But... Is he as bad as Jen? Worse. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, Jen, if you're listening, yeah, there is somebody worse than you out there. Don't worry. <laughs> you guys got to get him those dice. <laughs> <laughs> I bought him a pair of I bought him a set of like white dice, black lettering, completely like plain dice, so the so the colors don't confuse the dice any. And I bought him for him because maybe it was him buying dice. I mean we're trying to do everything. <laughs> and those dice roll shit too, but uh, that was actually that set of dice, that was a set that rolled a one. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, that's a bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, everybody. Yeah. We do have. There are dice superstitions out there, and I know everybody out there listening are like, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." That's I true. Mean, yeah, <laughs> my friend Jen. She's not known for rolling the best, but she's really known for rolling bad when she's shooting from a distance into a crowd. And Chris has seen it firsthand. <laughs> and my character has felt it firsthand, <laughs> or I guess first arrowed. Whatever we want to say that. <laughs> but hey. We love yeah. her. She's great to have mm-hmm. around. She's a hilarious gamer. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it was fun. Definitely lots of fun with that. Yep. So uh, and they take no. it well too. They take the ribbing well too. <laughs> yeah. I must say. <laughs> well, it's just. I mean, it's luck. What can you say? Well, the thing is. Oh, and there's one. Okay, one more thing, everybody. Sorry, um, but I was I was shooting a shit with them on chat today during the game and we're, we're in fantasy football and stuff together too so i'm like oh, no i'm like and we're playing each other and i'm smoking them i mean his care his players are like i mean three of his character players i'm i'm saying characters <laughs> yeah characters in fantasy They're football. pretty much characters pretty much, yeah. yep. <laughs> three of them scored like two points total Oof. which is horrible so i'm like yeah dude it's 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 you know it's like rolling the dice and i'm like Oh wait a minute! So yeah, he's like, "Dude, low blow." I'm like, yeah, it kind of is. But had to be said. <laughs> Anyways, so yes. Uh, so good. on to some news. You'd think What's people going? like that would appreciate the narrative dice system. 
Because at least they could fail on two he'll different find axes. A, he'll find a way. <laughs> he'll find a way, as Jen has found a way to yeah. fail. Right? <laughs> what? You mean I failed the roll with three triumphs? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so why not? <laughs> uh, so let's see here. So the news. Um, yeah, Tony and I, we had um, – so Jimmy Fett out on the boards, Jim Parton, he did the um, he did the G.I. Joe um, setting for and shared everybody – shared it for people. He had um, Tony and I on a live play about a week ago. And yeah, it just surprised us like on a Friday afternoon Friday and said, afternoon. hey, guys, when can you get together for an online game and – Chris and I just happened to say, well, we're free Sunday night. Yeah, so, so we did that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. There's going to be a little more about that in the show. Um, but the other big news, really, and I'm sure if anybody's been like on a desert island for deserted island for the last two weeks and have never been on the internet, <laughs> have <laughs> probably known that there's been kind of a mass exodus from the Google Plus community. Or, you know, if people have been on Google Plus or whatever, I know we have. Our mm-hmm. communities, our podcast, and even the Nerds International community, we kind of made a mass exodus from there and moved over to the MeWe or Mayway or Mew, Mew. <laughs> Mew or whatever they're calling it. Um, yep. yep. So, yeah. Uh, Google announced that they're getting rid of Google Plus in the next 10 months. They're Something completely like taking and scrapping the network. So for, for the first for like I think for like open – public and stuff, but I think the enterprise version of that for companies yeah, for and stuff, for businesses, that's still going on, but it's the, I guess it's what's their answer to Facebook or something, right? For the, right. For so, well, it's a social there. network. The it social didn't, network, it didn't yeah. take off. There was, it was really a place where nerds went and then a few other fringe groups. It well, wasn't really big other fringe people. Groups. Yeah. Um, but uh, so we went. We started researching a bunch of us, and eventually, uh, Maite, um, Jim's wife, <laughs> Jim Parton's <laughs> wife, she uh, she suggested that we try Mewe or Miwi or Mew, Mew or whatever you want to pronounce it. Uh, I say Miwi because it looks like me we <laughs> me and we. I think that's what the intended name to call it is, but um, me and we. <clears throat> Then you know if you're Scottish, it's oh me we. What a wee a wee dram on me we. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, the whole Nerds International community, we we decided to make the jump over there, and it's been mm-hmm. great. Um, you can uh, it it has the normal forum type format that uh, or post. And then reply format that uh, Google Plus had, mm-hmm. but it also has chat. It also has uh, events that you can schedule. Mm-hmm. It also has um, things like that. So if you join there, send us a request. We'll add you to our Finding the Narrative channel, mm-hmm. and we have something exclusive for our may we yeah. listener. Uh, people who join us over there. Mm-hmm. Um, up until now, the exclusive content has been what I'm going to reveal for to the, for the interweb for today on our show. Uh, but uh, starting today, uh, after this show, our we will have our upcoming schedule of mm-hmm. what topics we're going to be talking about and when we're going to be recording. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we should put. You know what? Now thinking about it, just kind of brainstorming here. Maybe maybe that event part. Of our page should be, we should put like events on there, like when we're recording next. Yep. yep. And then, and then if you click, you click on that, and you can see what we're planned on for that show. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's it's a it's an idea. Uh, I'm going to put it up there. It's going to be exclusive on Mewe. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, I'm not be I will not be posting it both Facebook and I just don't feel like keeping up on both both. Um, yep. So. Um, if you care what we're going to be recording about next or what our next couple of ske- shows scheduled out look mm-hmm. like and how when we're going to record them, yep. we usually try to do every two weeks. But in this case, we're we're actually going to be um, doing uh, – Delayed a week. Yeah, we're going to be delayed a week from, from things here and there, and mm-hmm. you'll find that out and you'll know it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so when you go over there, try and look for, do a search for finding a narrative, and then I think it'll say apply, but really it does, it just adds to a list, and if, if Tony or I gets to it, get to it first, we'll just say, yep, accept. It's not like you have to, don't be intimidated by the apply button. 
it's not going to ask you a bunch of questions like, you know, who's the name of your firstborn? You need to give us your firstborn before you allow you into our group. No, just hit apply and then we'll then you you'll get an acceptance or something, right? I think it's something like that, right, Tony? Yeah, it's it's almost too easy. I wanted people to have a like a hazing before they could join, but Chris Chris wouldn't allow it. So it's yeah, but you know, I think them listening to our show is hazing enough. <laughs> This is true. <laughs> if you've listened to it this long and you know where to go and where we are, then <laughs> right. So, and yeah. you can give us your feedback over there, which we had one of our listeners. Nice uh, segue, Tony. Yeah, try and look yeah, your one phone. of our listeners. <laughs> yeah, find the phone, Tony. Uh, gave us some feedback on uh, Miwi, mm-hmm. and that's uh, Gary Anastasio. Uh, hello, Gary. He says, uh, love the podcasts. Uh, what's next on the agenda? And yeah, Gar- thanks to Gary, uh, we decided that, you know what, we're going to post our schedule over there. Mm-hmm. But over here, we record. Uh, both Chris and I responded to him. Uh, and pretty much uh, anytime you post, one of us, if not both of us, will reply to you. Pretty much. Uh, yeah. Within, within a, a couple within days. A couple hours. A couple hours a day. Or so. Me, I usually get it within minutes, but I may not have the time to respond until hours later. Because you're sleeping on your forklift. I mean, you're working on your forklift. I, I don't reason. drive a forklift all the time. I don't know if I've gotten that out there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I'm messing with you. No, I, I, uh, I uh, actually don't always have my phone on me at work. Mm-hmm. There are times I don't. So. Yeah. Um, Anyhow, on that note, <laughs> let's go into the feedback, shall we? Right. Yeah. So what was coming up? Do we tell them now or do they have to go to Melee? Uh, well. Show? Well, our next show isn't going to be, we're not going to record it until after Con and the Cobb, right? No, no, no. We're, we got another show the week before, the week before. So what That's I've right, got. We do, don't we? Yes, we do. So right now we have today's show, which today we are talking all about horror in Genesis. And oh, the horror. Episode. Yes, tonight's episode name. Oh, the horror. <laughs> oh, we got to say it like that. Oh, the horror. <laughs> and then on uh, November 4th, we have heroic abilities in and out of Terranoth that we're mm-hmm. going to be talking about. And then on Ooh. November 18th, we have, we're going to hope to have a guest and we're going to have our con on the cob after action report. Cool. So at least one guest, maybe two. We'll, know. we'll find out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But now, hopefully, I'm hoping we'll have somebody on that we converted to Genesis. Yeah, That's what I'm hoping. Yeah, let's hope. Because I feel we have potential within the Nerds International community yes, right. to make at least one recruit. Hashtag SWK. <laughs> Which, by the way, for all you have who haven't heard, that is Savage World's killer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those guys over there are just giddy right now, the Savage Worlds fans, because their Savage Worlds is the new Kickstarter for their new edition. Yeah, which uh, might be killing Savage Worlds itself. No, yeah, no. Savage Worlds could be the Savage Worlds killer. No, right. uh, and did you notice that if you look at their new rules for their Savage Worlds, they're adding narrative elements? <gasps> hmm. Oh. hmm. It's like they figured something out. Oh, I'm just kidding. No, I, I love Savage Worlds, too. I, 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 I think it's a fun system. Um, it, it doesn't do the things Genesis does, that Genesis does, and Genesis doesn't do the thing it does, that right. it does. And, and they're separate. Mm-hmm. And, and no matter how much we pick on our friends that play Savage Worlds, we play it, too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and there's a reason uh, why it's, it's, its tagline is fast, fun, and furious. Furious, exactly. fast, and fun. Those Fast. three in a ro- in a row or whatever. The, the triple Fs. The yes. triple Fs. You know it. <clears throat> Getting back to the feedback. Yep. So we had one a while back from Joe from West Chicago. Yo, Joe from West Chicago. Whoop All right. Whoop. <laughs> says hi guys. I enjoy your podcast and appreciate the scenarios you work through as part of your show. It's a great way to feature the Genesis system and how to work through different tones and settings. I'm really trying to escape common tropes in my planning for an upcoming campaign, which I'm sorry. We, we did respond a while back in writing to this, but yeah. um, didn't really have 
a show topic to cover this, but anyhow, going back into this, uh, one of the things that always seems to happen in my games is a scene similar to this. A minion NPC captured after an easy or medium melee combat. PCs inter interrogate the low-level NPC, which either leads to the NPC getting killed because they don't know anything, or providing detailed instructions on how to sneak into enemy encampments and capture the flag. I've been hearing about other systems like Blades in the Dark, or Gumshoe, or even L5R 4th Edition, which have mechanics and or skills set up to handle these issues, more like a social encounter or through narrative. Here, my questions for you are, how would you handle encounters like this? Using a more social encounter approach, are there any core Genesis skills, rules, for handling a spy network or investigation scenarios. Are you aware of any Genesis community resources which address the style of gameplay that allows the PCs to use points or skills to uncover plot points or investigation clues? My goals as a GM in asking these questions include find ways to keep the narrative moving when the PCs don't know how to move the story forward. Make the characters aware they are characters in a world, not a third person just manipulating it. And avoid lazy GMing and PC play by not relying on tired tropes of tavern scenes and minion capture. Sorry for the long question, and thank you for your thoughts. Joe. So first thing I pointed out to Joe, and I pointed out last week because – you know, it seems to be my mantra lately is read some of the Star Wars books. They got great stuff in them. <laughs> so <laughs> exactly. I pointed that out. You know, and, and yeah, it will help with uh, running a spy game. You know, that whole section <clears throat> in uh, Ciphers and Masks, um, the Age of Rebellion book, is a great resource for that. Mm -hmm. But there, here's a couple things I have. One, Joe and listeners – you want to treat interrogations as a social combat sometimes. Um, I would say probably most of the time, if it makes and, sense. If it's outside and, of combat, you know what I mean? I would think so. And if the if it's an NPC that the player's captured, first of all, I'd never let them capture a minion. Um, just minions, oh, he died. Well, all I did was hit him with a paper towel roll. Yep, he had a heart, he had a heart attack. He died. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I don't let min I don't let the players capture minions. That me. I usually let them either capture a rival or a nemesis, a minor nemesis. Now, usually it's rivals. Now, if they're going to interrogate somebody, it's usually a rival. And first thing I do is I reset their strain right back to max before the interrogation. Doesn't matter how much you beat that guy to damn near death in the combat that you captured him. When you reset for the social encounter for that social uh, for that interrogation, mm -hmm. you reset his strain threshold back to max. Or in the case of a rival, it's strain and wounds together. Would you allow the Would you allow the the player the the, the PCs reset theirs too? Yeah. Well. Yeah. 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 Have them reset it all the strain. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Because they'll have the time to do that. Most players will do that anyway, but um, mm. on their own without you having to ask them to. But normally I would, yeah, let them completely reset their strain before they do their interrogation. Mm -hmm. um, and then you set the threshold. What I mean by set the threshold is either you want the guy to get half of his strain before he starts giving you nuggets of information. Mm -hmm. Or you say this guy's going to hold out to zero. And he's not right. going to give you anything until he hits zero. You set that threshold as a GM. And then uh, another thing that you can do, you know, you talked about he talked about how uh, the there's either the guy's be killed because he knows nothing, or he's um, he leads him, you know, gives him a roadmap through the to the end to capture the enemy flag. Why aren't your NPCs loyal to their bosses? Why aren't they? Sometimes trying to mislead the characters. Mm -hmm. Give them enough to get them captured. Give them enough to get them into the boss's clutches. Do things yeah. like that. There's nothing, even after they've beat your NPC's threshold with an interrogation, there's nothing that says he's going to take their side. Right. And, and, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't necessarily call for a role for them to see whether he's lying or not unless they ask. Like, oh, yeah. maybe this guy's lying or whatever. And, and they're like, oh, can we check if he's lying? And sure, make a vigilance check right. against the de uh, against the, the deception. 
of your captured minion or rival, or not minion, your your captured NPC. Yes, and mm -hmm. that one way you can do that in Genesis is when the players roll threat or despair on their checks, you can throw in red herrings in what your NPC tells them. Um, good example. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> a good example. Uh, your PCs are interrogating a guy to uh, get into the enemy fortress. Well, he might get them the passcode to get into the enemy fortress, but he might tell them an old passcode so that it'll raise someone's, maybe raise the alarm. Or when they maybe... Yeah. Or maybe he will offer to lead them into the fortress, knowing that he's going to be walking by a place where he can set off a silent alarm mm -hmm. um, without the players knowing it. Um, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, Some of this might be might have to. You might not know everything beforehand. So some of this might have to be off the cuff, you know. Especially, yeah, let's bring them with. And you know, the thing is, listen to your players and roll uh, with it too. Yeah, come on, man. You got to listen to your players. Roll with it. Yeah. You're saying nah? <laughs> no, I'm saying yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Because yeah. I'm hearing Chris preach, brother. Preach. preach. Listen to those players. That's right. Listen to them. <laughs> that, I'll say amen from here on out when you're saying it. Step okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> it sounded like you were saying nah. Yeah, but yeah, just listen to them. If they want to bring, yeah, go around. But then, you, but then, yeah, you'll probably have to come up with stuff on the fly and, you know, maybe scratch some notes, you know, if you have... Um, if you have those encounters where, you know, potentially if it would make sense for them to capture somebody, um, write down, jot, jot down just some notes. You know, here's a couple red herrings you can throw out, right? GM's journal. Have GM's in journal, a GM right. either either your Tony style of post-it notes everywhere or uh, <laughs> a, just, a uh, just a little bit of tiny notes off to the side of little things that you're willing to give away, ways to spend threats and despair in social encounters, mm -hmm. um, things like that that you can throw in there that you'll have ready before your adventure. Excuse me. Gosh, a little bit of prep. Mean. I burped and oh. you went, excuse me. That's awesome. Yeah, because I burped too. <laughs> Man, Pardon me, everybody. I tell you. Yeah, Melissa fed me good today. Uh, but anyhow, um, so yeah, those uh, those are the ways you run uh, interrog – I run interrogations. I run them as social combat. And mm -hmm. and we've talked about that in a previous show, how to run a social, social combat. And that also allows – for. They're not in the core Genesis book. They're not in the Ter Realms of Terranoth book. They are in the um, the Genesis expanded talents list that was created and put out on the G uh, the FFG forums. And of course, that's you know Chris and I have talked about that enough. I always use that um, just about because there's not anything in there that breaks the game. Um, mm -hmm. But in there, there's two talents that allow you to use uh, things in an interrogation. Um, Good cop and bad cop, which are amazing talents. And if your characters love to interrogate, point them in the direction of those talents. That'll put them on the track of okay. Now they want to. Now they'll want to interrogate, playing good cop and bad cop, and doing back and forth because they'll want to use those talents. Yep, absolutely. Um, That's a great point. And and they'll do those in social encounters. Um, and so yeah, that was really all I had. Yeah. Um, the only the only thing that I have that really add to that is um, we did episode five that we did and words can hurt too man we go over the social encounters you know in depth um, so if you guys want to listen to that and of course there are the guidelines for the social encounters in the book but really what I what I want to say for Joe um, kudos to you man as a GM this is an example of one of the unwritten things that you cannot read in a book what mm -hmm. joe is doing here he wants to make the game better for his players mm -hmm. he wants it to be more interesting he doesn't want it to be the same meeting in a bar which by the way always a fun trope to do <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> when it when the time comes you can always do it it doesn't really matter just mix it up a little bit make the bartender i don't know be like a cousin of one of your players or something like that. And then later on in the later on in the campaign when they come back to the same tavern or bar, dude, that bartender was killed by some bandits. Then your PCs are like, what? He was cool. Or maybe the bar winch was just some saucy saucy woman that just really, you know, probably, you know, took your took your um 
what do you call it? You're a fighter down a peg or whatever it was, but you remember it. You remember these characters, and you kind of got get into it. And then when they when your players come back to this place, you know that's another way of mixing it up, right? Having the real world have the story when they're not there, have the world kind of evolve a little bit behind the scenes. You know, a, a little a little tired trope twist here that I did a mm-hmm. while back to, to to reiterate on this. Mm-hmm. Um, my my friends also made a comment, the Grognard group, years ago. Why are we always meeting in a tavern? Why do we just, when we see a random person, we're like, you look like a good, honest person. Join our group. You know, you we made jokes friend? about <laughs> Yes. They made these jokes. And um, so I t- had this little thing that I did that I took, and we were starting at higher level characters. I think we'd started at 6th level. Okay. Um, this is in uh, Pathfinder or d and okay. I'm not sure which. But they went into a bar, and in the bar they were not treated even remotely well. Other members of the crowd were having a great time. They were treated like outsiders. Well, long and short of it, the the whole hook of the beginning of going into this bar is that somebody famous and rich was supposed to be going to, into this tavern and and ex, and a criminal organization had replaced everyone in the inn with actors <laughs> that's classic to assassinate that guy awesome. and the players walked in to bumble this whole thing up and so it started out as your normal trope we're meeting in a bar you know we're going to party and have a good time and then we're going to go on adventure and i twisted it like the minute they got the in the end, uh, they they were they were like met at the door by a bouncer who said you can't come in you, and you know telling them that, until they convinced him and he would turn to the manager manager would be like okay let him in you know after grudgingly letting them into the bar grudgingly sitting them down <laughs> them half cooked food just treating them like crap <laughs> trying to get them to leave so that they could carry out this assassination attempt that they were trying to do that's awesome dude um so yeah mm-hmm. and 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 it was a great way to start a, a always try to find one way to use those predictable tropes is to turn them on their head yep and that's that's yeah, one of my usual mantras but mm-hmm. yeah i like to do that when you hear them complaining about seeing the same old trope over and over again, like Chris says, listen to your players. You hear them complaining about it or like, oh, yay, mm-hmm. another tap. Now's the time to turn it on its head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so kudos, so kudos to you, Joe, for wanting to make your game better and yeah. asking questions. That's the right attitude to have. It really is. And I commend you for it. And speaking of listening to your, characters, your players... Was running. I was running um, Starfinder the other night. Okay, yeah. And they are so the there's the Starfinder Society. When you start this adventure path, right, you kind of become like acolytes, and you have to, you know, go on these missions and whatever. But at the beginning, they're like, "Well, then are we are we rank one now, Starfinder dudes?" And we're like, "Okay, sure, I'll do that. Yeah, you're rank one now." And sure enough, just the they I just had them level up last week. And then he's, and then they're they're going around asking questions the other night, and my and my buddy puts like three fi- three fingers over his Starfinder patch, and goes, oh yeah, hey, see, rank three Starfinder, <gasps> and and all my MPs were rea- were reacting to it like, really, you're you're rank three Starfinder, you know, members, absolutely, come on in, come on in and do this. But it was just one of those things I had. There's nothing in the adventure path written for it. I didn't uh-huh. have any clue that I was going to do this, but I'm listening to them talking about it, joking about it around a table, and they just react. And we were just cracking up, having fun. And that's what nice. it's all about. That's what it's all about. So, yeah, it's good times. Good all right, times. Well, other than the answers we left you also in the email, I hope that helps you, Joe, and helps everybody else. So that's it for feedback today. Yes, indeedy. So we got a little 50 pieces of awesome to give away. You want to do that, Butter? Let's do it. All right, welcome to 50 Pieces of Awesome. Awesome. This is where Chris finds some cool stuff on the internet (laughs) and talks about it. Well, I was there when Chris found this one. So (laughs) tell everybody. Yes, you were. 
Oh, oh yeah, Jim's one shot, man that he that he ran us through that last Sunday night. Yeah. That was um, yeah, that was fifty pieces of awesome. I must say, it was about about two and a half hours of awesomeness. Um, we started off in realms of Tiernoth. Yeah, and I won't spoil it beyond that. Um, oh come on, you can spoil a little bit. Can spoil I? spoil who you chose to make as a character. <laughs> Oh well, there's that. Yes, I play. I play Killzak. If you guys remember, Killzak the Dragon Slayer. Yeah, the but one- not Killzak the one who'd already killed a dragon. No, this is a this is a fifty experience points worth earned experience points of Killzak. So he's a younger version of himself from the one shot. Because I'm we're, we were thinking that one shot and Killzak is like two hundred earned XP or whatever. So it's gonna yeah. be a little while. Um, but yeah, that was it. And he, you know, we we went live on Twitch TV in Jimmy Fett's channel. There, um, he threw it up on YouTube. I'm going to have the links to it in the show notes, so you guys can see our ugly mugs and how we would play this game. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Get to, get to see me uh, play as Gorgo Rage Mantle. <laughs> yep. My uh, mm-hmm. my pri- orc primalist. I uh, decided when. When Jim said uh, he wanted to run us through Terranoth, I'm like, finally, someone, oh, this is great. I get to finally play a character in Terranoth because I have yet to play. I've run it multiple times. <laughs> yep. Don't get to play it. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, finally. And I had like a, I'm going to go look at my list of characters that I wanted to make. I had like 14 characters to choose from <laughs> that I had had ideas on how to make. And I'm like, oh, da, 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 da. I'm like, Chris hadn't picked one yet, and I'm like, fuck it, I'm going to do this one. And then Chris chose Killzak, and we were like the perfect buddy partner type buddy team (laughs) of like Laurel and Hardy, but we also kicked a little ass too. We were more like Starsky and Hutch, really. (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was, it was fun. It was fun. We had a great time with it. Yeah. And I think that was the first, dude, I think that's the first, I think that's the first time we've actually played in a game together. Uh, second. You've, second time? When was the first one? We, we Did we do Tales from the Loop together? No. No. Nope. What, um, what did we play together? We played in Stefan's Shintar together. <gasps> yes, we did. That's right. That's right, we did. Yeah, nope. it, was, it was just, that was fun. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And there was a nice little, um, nice little twist and hook in there for you all. Yeah, you guys got to check it out. It yeah. was so fun. And... Like I said, Jim did a really good job. He took a show idea that we talked about just in passing when we're rambling mm-hmm. back and forth between me and Chris. Things that aren't normally in our show notes and we just decided to bullshit about. Yep. He much. took something that we had said mm-hmm. and <laughs> gave it back to us. And yep. that was amazing. Thank you, Jim. Thank and you. And you, sir, are the winner of not only 50 Pieces of Awesome, but my eternal gratitude. <laughs> and my eternal gratitude as well. And I can't wait for episode two. There's a cream for that. And I'm going to leave it at that. Right? <laughs> All right. Let's move on then. Yeah, we've got okay. a, sh- a show to do. Yes, we do. All right. Welcome back, everybody. We are in the book of Genesis. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> that was probably the no meat meat. Um, dude, Chris, that was, that was the horrible. most angelic I've ever heard your voice. What are, <laughs> what are you complaining about? Oh, was it? Oh, yay. <laughs> you Anyways, need to add some auto tune to that, buddy. <laughs> might have to. Watch it. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, so we are so open up your good book of Genesis, everybody, to page two forty two, which is the um, horror rules. And I have to watch how I pronounce that because sometimes it comes out as horror rules. Right. So, all right, we're going down to red light district and going, we're going to talk about some horror rules. <laughs> but this is <Yeah>. horror. <laughs> That's just social combat. Those are the horror rules. Come on. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, Horror is tricky. You yep. want to use it. You don't want to use it too often because it's one of those things where when you are expecting it, that's when it doesn't work. When you're not expecting it, it's kind of when it really works. Um, I think the best. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and I like their little 
I, I call their sidebar over here kind of their, um, what do you call it, disclaimer, yeah. if you will, on page 242, real versus fun horror, basically saying, watch, you, you, I, I, and, and, I, and I know, I mean, you got to be sensitive to people's um, background, what they can take. Hopefully you will know your players really well, but if not, you kind of got to watch kind of what you do if you're running something like if you don't know who's like at a con game. Those can be kind of kind of difficult, right? Especially if you're doing like body parts and gore parts and that kind of stuff, and even like age level appropriateness of gore and intestines being pulled out and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Well, so yeah, you gotta you gotta plate. be sensitive. Boilerplate. You kind of got to be sensitive to it, but. Yeah, boilerplate before you run before you run your mm-hmm. game. Boilerplate. Tell people what you're gonna be. You mm-hmm. know, it's gonna have blood. It's gonna have guts. It's gonna have some gory tones. I warned people when I ran my Deep Madness game right away. This is mm-hmm. gonna be gory. If you can't handle gory horror or you cannot handle adult themes, please take the time to leave us now. Exactly. Uh, yeah. No yeah. one's gonna judge you for it. Uh, it. You know, not everybody can handle these situations, and I totally understand it. Mm-hmm. Of course, nobody left, and we had a good time. Mm-hmm. And and one of the things that you can do when you're running a horror game, and and it says right here in the running horror the games in the first por- paragraph, it says um, mix it up. Don't run terror and uh, uh, tension all the way through the entire game. There's nothing wrong with having mm-hmm. a little bit of humor and levity thrown mm-hmm. in there to keep it less tense. It also lets the tension kind of levels to Good. drop down so that drop when down. there's time for a major reaction from your players, you'll get it. Right. Kind of like think, I mean, they use the, the roller coaster analogy and that's exactly what it is. You want those, you want those up and down, up and down. And then by the end of the night, they're probably, they'll be feeling like they're exhausted. <laughs> I know there are times when I've run some, or even have been in games that were very intense in, on kind of on the edge of your seat, and you know, kind of want to get through it, and then at the end of that, you're like, "Wow, it's just kind of mentally draining and fun as hell," mm-hmm. you know. So, yeah, um, yeah. As a as a GM running it, you want to know what kind of monster type creatures and all their abilities and inside and out. You want to know these things well in advance. You're mm-hmm. not going to be. This isn't an adventure. Running a good horror game isn't one you can just throw together at the last minute. You got to prep. Um, because there's a lot of little nuances that you got to get. One is pacing. You have to pace it properly. Another is knowing your monsters. Do you want them to be unfathomable horror Mm -hmm. that is undefeatable? Do you want them? If you want them like that, then you have to build them like that. There isn't anything existing in Genesis that you can do that with right now. Um, If you want them to be just monsters that scary, but the players can defeat then, you know, that you need to have planned in advance. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, there are, there. they go into, um, so they go into like themes in horror. They have a couple of different types of themes. One is like a supernatural, like ghostly hauntings or demonic possession and, and such, you know, like that. And then they say on the opposite end of the spectrum are your realistic horror and psychological horrors that are, um, you know, that have the, or maybe you're chasing down on a, you know, a disturbed like serial killer or mm-hmm. th- th- those kinds of things. Um, and they said, you know, Hey, even the environment might be a threat, you know, right. around you, they might be trying to consume you. And they say, these are all like external horrors and everything, but there are things that are like madness and corruption of your PCs itself. And that's where I think the games like Call of Cthulhu and or and other horror based games really shine because they have mechanisms for that where you do have that that, you know, hey, going down the river and, you know, Apocalypse Now or in or Heart of Darkness, right? Where you're just you're slipping away. Your your madness, mm-hmm. your sanity is just slipping away. That's why people play those games and you know, and yep. just want to take that kind of a journey you know, um, in playing those games. And this is kind of what, those are the kind of things that we're talking about here. Yep. For it. Yeah. Yep. Nope. Yep. That's exactly it. You want to tackle the themes that you want to tackle. You know, in my case, mm-hmm. I made this deep madness game based on a board game that I kickstarted. Um, the, the little bit of story snippets that I got from all the Kickstarter updates, which by the way, it's in the mail. It's coming Tuesday. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> but anyhow, can't um, wait to play it at, at kind of the cob with you do. 
Well, I might just run the adventure as a pickup adventure and use all the tiles and miniatures and such as for it. So. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Uh, but anyhow, uh, right. that's neither here nor there. No, it's not. <laughs> it's but, there. It's then. It's <laughs> how many hours away? <laughs> uh, I don't know. You're the one who got the countdown. But anyhow. Yes, do. Um, but you've got, yeah, you've got to tackle. Uh, you got to know what your tone is what you're whether you're using that internal or external horror or supernatural or or natural terror um whether you're using alien parasites or whether you're talking about magic and and using it in a system that has magic mm-hmm. you you have to know all that in advance as a gm and then as a player you have to have some buy-in too mm-hmm. as a player you know you're playing a horror game so get yourself in the mood you know, watch yeah. a couple horror movies before you play the game. Yeah. Get yourself in a mood to to want to be held on the edge of of your seat and mm-hmm. suspense, and so that. And then you know, when your character loop, this isn't a GM versus player type game anymore, really. Yeah, I mean, D and D used to be back in the day, very adversarial uh, feeling to it. But nowadays, especially with Genesis, it's, it's more of a collaborative storytelling that involves a player getting involved in, okay, your character has lost some bit of their person, mm-hmm. bit of their sanity. You got to be prepared to take your character off the deep end yeah. <laughs> and be willing to, and be willing like, to, yeah, when your character is it. frozen in terror, you want them to be frozen in terror because that's a good reaction that the GM can play on and then uh, brings the other players in to the the shared world. Jim, again, Jim Parton, he was amazing at this when I was running my Deep Madness and Daryl too. Both of them were like just in the grips of being their character and I loved it because when their character felt terror, they literally expressed it Mm -hmm. for the other players to hear and feel mm-hmm. and you know if we'd have been sitting at a table i'm sure the other players been like oh good he's freaky you know moving over a little bit <laughs> some people might be intimidated by that some people might be a bit um shy when yeah. it comes when it comes to expressing themselves and 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 getting into the mind and you know role playing those kinds of things but yeah i think a game like this will kind of bring people out of their shells because everybody's kind of collaborating together it's not again it's not that adversarial thing really anymore it's you were, that's we're there to have fun and this is fun doing these things and taking the journeys and telling the stories mm-hmm. <clears throat> And horror is a genre not everyone gets. I totally understand Correct. that. If it's yeah. not for you, don't play it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think a lot of people are. Oh, I don't like playing those kind of games. Well, that's fine. That's personally, I don't judge you for that. Oh, Me, I love. You. I love every kind of uh, <laughs> genre of. Uh, role-playing game for the most part there's like one or two that really aren't my shtick like old west really isn't my shtick i don't mm-hmm. you know you just wouldn't wasn't play a, in a game like that yeah i just don't do it very mm-hmm. often now yeah. i like i happen to like deadlands as a setting because it's not just old west it's old west with supernatural elements mm-hmm. and the the horror west, thrown in. yeah and that west. makes it fun i also don't like weird war stuff I, I may enjoy watching the movies now and again, but I don't like playing in them. Where where it's a where it's a realistic war setting, I and I honestly don't like it because I was part of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. being part of the military, it's just not fun for me to play in a military setting. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, um, I hear you, man. The, I hear more, you. the more militaristic the setting, the less likely I'm going to be like it. So you got to know what you like before you sign up to play in one of these games. Save Age of Rebellion. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's okay. That's, yeah, Star exactly. Wars. that's Star Wars. That's something completely different. Yeah. So, everything, okay. Star, everything Star Wars is good. You can do horror in Star Wars. I've done it. <laughs> oh, I, did an, yeah. I did an adventure. Uh, have you ever read the book uh, Death Troopers? Have not, but I have. I think I might have a Pope picture, a piece of art that I bought from Con on the Cob last year with some Death Troopers in it. Well, I think they look like zombies. At least they look like zombies. Yes, yes. Yeah, this dude. is this is about a derelict ship that is found, and there are zombie stormtroopers on it, and. And yeah, and Pretty you sure can totally run it. that. You can totally run that as a one shot, and oh, yeah, horror theme in Star Wars works. But anyhow, be that's great. beside the point. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, and it's one of those things where. So I'm, I'm, I want to read a couple of sentences here on page. 
top of the page 243 mm-hmm. paragraph on the le- on the right hand side no matter the specifics horror should always be fresh and something new to the characters or at a level beyond anything they've seen before familiarity ruins fear and horror should always be exciting so it's one of those things yeah i mean if it's you do over the same things over and over and over eh. but you mix it up a little bit and yeah. there was some place in here too that I remember reading that it's not necessarily you know we were talking about you know the blood and the gore and whatever but it's not necessarily always showing or describing that stuff it's and what your characters your player characters actually see but it could be the things that they hear mm-hmm. maybe the thing that they smell in uh-huh. other rooms or something like that and oh yeah unknown- tackle the Tackle the other senses. Yes. You know. And it's the fear of the unknown, which is really one of the creepiest fears ever, right? You don't know right. what you don't know. You're like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> you know? Maybe they see a big... Okay, so I'm thinking Lord of the Rings when Samwise is like walking up the walking up those stairs. Arr! You know? And, he's, yeah. and the orcs looking down are seeing like this four-armed huge thing but no it's little sam coming up with a couple of swords and staying and <laughs> running up you know so they're seeing those shadows but it's really not what's coming but it's their perception of it and i don't know that's kind of fun yeah no that's Figure great so they go into on page 243 uh in the in the core book here they go into fear guidelines um yeah. the, the new rules for fear mm-hmm. so let's go over that let's do it so all those circumstances in a horror game may, game may be scary to your players. They should be far more horrifying for the player's characters. After all, the characters don't have the luxury of knowing that it's all only a game. <laughs> to represent this and recognize that some characters are braver than others, you can add the fear rules to your game. When the characters in your game confront something that you feel them t- that may be terrifying to them, you can have them make a discipline skill check. We sometimes call this a fear check. From here on out, I'll be referring to it as a fear check. Exactly. As a GM, you set the difficulty for this check. Now, there's guidelines on how to do that. There is a chart at the Mm -hmm. bottom of the page that tells you what you should use for a difficulty setting. And then... um, So something like... So so an easy startle check. That'd be like somebody who like... You're somebody. You open up their closet, and somebody goes boom. Okay. Yeah, right. I mean, that's just an easy kind of check. You're like, oh crap. You know what the heck are you doing that for? That'd be like an easy check to kind of get or, startled. Or and yeah. Or there's um you're you in for a normal check like you are playing in a like a investigative Scooby Doo type teenagers that are solving <laughs> a mystery. You're going into an empty uh mansion and you hear eerie music coming from one of the other floors that would be that would be a normal average check okay now when you do when your scooby-doo characters do go further in Mm -hmm. and they see these apparitions floating around maybe they see a ghost or they think they see a ghost or they perceive something along those lines that's another another that that would be a that would be a um an example of a very hard or a hard, very afraid type of check. Or if they're being mm-hmm. attacked by like a pack of wild animals or anything with a hard check that's in the Tiernoth book. You know, like one of those um one of those um demons mm-hmm. from Tiernoth, you know, it'd be hard. Right. Uh, then there's daunting. Daunting, good example of daunting. I used this one once before. I had, uh, in Star Wars, I had the characters doing an Indiana, St- Indiana Jones style raid on, a, on an old Sith crypt. And okay. one of the players, one of the players was uh, possessed by a, a Sith force ghost. Ooh. And that ended up being a daunting fear check. Yes, for for everyone seeing a, a Jawa shoot force lightning at them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a Jawa, yeah, baby. <laughs> I want to play a Jawa so bad. <laughs> Ooh, <dee-dee. laughs> there you go. And then a um, and then a formidable check where you leave your characters utterly terrified would be on the lines of something that is so paralyzingly fearful that their sanity just breaks something oh. along the lines of like a cthulhu monster or um demons like a 
demon lord, a Balrog just, that's on your just, shirt. Just uh, Shalgoth. Oh yeah, my Balrog shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like when all the when all of the Lord of the Rings, good example. All of them saw the Balrog for the first time. Yeah, there were loads dropped in their pants, and they ran the other damn direction. Yes, they did. <laughs> but Gandalf, he's a trooper. He's like, no, baby, he made that ter- that formidable check for sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, he saw XP and loot. He's like, this is a boss monster. Yeah, Go, dude. run. I'm going <laughs> to ride this bitch to the abyss, baby. <laughs> Where's Glamdring? I'm going to throw this in his chest and ride him down. That was a killer. <laughs> Those so, are yeah. your formidable checks. And then, of course, you, uh, the, it's not on the chart, but impossible. Impossible. We have you to see that destiny himself. point. Yes, Absolutely. Uh, you see it ends up being a formidable check with a flip mm-hmm. of the destiny point for them mm-hmm. to even make it. A primordial, so, a primordial Titan, you know, oh. from like our primordial um, Machina game, right? If one of those were still alive, hell, what the fuck? Oh, right? yeah. I mean, some, the world destroyer, a Tarasque, uh, right? Oh, In D&D. Tarask. The Tarask, <laughs> Tarasque, Tarask, whatever the hell you want to call it. That we call him Uncle freaking, Teddy. Uncle Teddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come here! Give me a hug. <laughs> Uncle Teddy's coming to pick you up. That's right. My barbarian's gonna go give Uncle Teddy a hug. <laughs> uh, so yeah. then, I have stories about Uncle Teddy that has showed up a lot in my Grognard group. But nice, anyhow, <laughs> nice. Uh, so then, I mean, so so you make the check, and of course, if you you can either fail or not, um, okay. you can also generate threat. You can generate advantage. Triumphs and dis- uh, or despairs, and they have. Ooh, pardon me. Mm-hmm. The effects of these checks. So, like, if okay. you fail it, if you fail a check, if you fail a fear check, simply you're going to be disoriented for the rest of the encounter, which means you get a setback to everything, basically. You know, because you're just as long as the source of that fear is still there and you can see it, um, your character. If you fail a fear check, you're gonna. Um, you're going to be, you know, off for the rest of the encounter. Simple as that. Okay. Well, then they go into the uh, table 4-2 on page 244. They go into things you can do with um, – oh, not on that table. Sorry. on the oh. In the in the, in the effects text. of fear. Yeah, yeah in the, the text. text. Yeah. And the things you can do when threat and despair are rolled. Mm-hmm. Um, There's like so, an adrenaline rush that you might get if you make it, but if you – have but if you succeed with threat, you know you take some strain because you know maybe you get a boost die on your next check, and but you um what do you call it? But you uh you suffer some strain because of the you know you feel threatened, frozen mm-hmm. in terror if you if you um if you fail with a lot of threat or despair, right? I mean All right. Okay, and then there's um, yeah, fleeing in terror, frozen in terror. Uh, then we also have the uh, advantage and triumph. You have steady nerves. When a character keeps their nerves and suffers no ill effects, obviously this is a good uh, this is a good result for passing the fear check. But then it goes into stand with me. Uh, the character's steadfast response emboldens their allies. An allied character is forced to make a fear check against the same source adds a boost die. This is a great way for passing on for passing a fear check with advantage. Mm-hmm. Oh, slight little go back here. Mm-hmm. When so back on page 423 423 422 You're dyslexic. Yeah, I'm, Liz, I'm Lizdexic right now. <laughs> so under <laughs> new rules for fear where it says there's a there's a um there's a sentence here that says remember um their fear motivation. Remember, we, we roll motivations mm-hmm. for our characters. If this fear check they have to roll is somehow related to their fear in their motivation, right? So, for instance, in Kilzak's case, he actually fears the dragon, the ancient dragon, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's in, I listed that as his fear in his motivation. So when he makes that initial fear check or has to when he's attacking this guy, he's going to get some minuses. He should right. at least, right? I mean, he should get a setback right. die, a couple setback die, maybe even an upgrade. An right. If it's a upgrade. specific nemesis like that, I would even upgrade it. If it's a generic terror, like um, in my Deep Madness game, one of the characters had a fear of drowning. There you go. And they're in an underwater station. 
and when the water is coming in through the walls that should be automatic upgrade dude right an automatic upgrade or mm-hmm. but when they hear the sound of dripping water in the distance probably a setback it's just a setback die yep yeah so so keep in mind of that oh that sorry i, I, I had just thought about that. oh dude that's a great audible i'm glad mm-hmm. you called it yeah, yeah. um so and then you know like i was saying back to the uh, advantage and triumph fearless uh, the character faces a source of fear and finds it that it no longer has a hold on them they automatically pass within any further fear checks from that source this is a good result for succeeding on a triumph with a triumph um, but you should not apply these results if the source of is the character's fear mo- motivation right so say so, if, if Kilzak got that triumph yeah when overcoming the fear against this ancient dragon yeah I mean it, it's not like that fear's ever going to go away. No way. Right, but, but it might be negated for the encounter. Correct. Correct. Yep. Yep. That'd be a great way to do it, just for the encounter, negate mm-hmm. it. Um, and mm-hmm. yeah, that's a great way to spend a triumph. Another is to maybe you cause another player to snap out of the a fear check that they failed. Very true. That's another great way to spend a triumph. Mm-hmm. I did that in my Deep Madness game. Somebody rolled a triumph, and I let them drag somebody else along and snap them out of it. You know, they gave them a slap across the face and kind of woke them up. <laughs> Someone <laughs> who was frozen in terror. Like so That's cool. That, that's cool. And speaking of being rolling, these, rolling the threats mm-hmm. and despairs, they actually have rules for sanity. Yeah. About which this, I, which get triggered... When you roll, which could be when they do fail a fear check with a with a despair or five threat. Wow, that seems like a lot of threat, but still, yeah, you know. Then then you would suffer a mental tra- mental trauma, which is a mental te- traumas. Yeah, that's the table Tony was talking about. Table four point right. two at the top of that page to uh, through uh, two forty four. <laughs> Right, the mental trauma should be the same difficulty as that of the check. So if they fa- if they fail the hard difficulty check, then you go to the hard section, where it's a delusion, and then you would give them one of the effects there on the chart. Right. Um, that's one way to run sanity. Mm-hmm. Um, then of course, if you roll, if you make successful fear checks beyond um, and get a triumph, you might be able to remove a mental trauma, or you work with your GM on. You know, maybe there's medications they take, or maybe there's therapy that they go through, or whatever, to kind of get rid of that. And or, I think this is a great way to handle this in a long-term campaign. I think if so. you're doing a long, if you're doing a long-term campaign, and you're going to throw in horror elements, like let's look at my Terranoff game that I ran for you and Jen and Dave and from my Gr- mm-hmm. Grugner and Dale from my Grugner group. Mm-hmm. The night you guys faced the werewolves in the barn, yeah. I could very easily have turned that into just a horror adventure. Yep. And had the fear checks and the – in fact, I did have the fear checks involved in that. Yep. I know. Just I had, that I, one I adventure. I, have, I think I might have failed mine, and I, I had yes, setbacks you did. throughout the whole – Yeah, you, uh, you mm-hmm. did. I ran it with just the fear rules, but I could have thrown in the sanity rules if any of you had fe- uh, rolled mm-hmm. a despair or rolled enough uh, threat. Mm-hmm. I could have thrown in these sanity rules and used them just for that encounter mm-hmm. for that one adventure right. um there's nothing wrong with using just that tone in one adventure in a longer campaign it's yeah. a great way like if you're running a long-term campaign and you're coming up on a certain oh i don't know october 31st holiday <laughs> and you want to run oh, really? <laughs> and you want to run a, a horror themed game for your you know, instead of running a one shot run one night of horror for those characters maybe it's a right. dream sequence or mm-hmm. maybe it's like i ran where it's just one night they you know they're traveling and all of a sudden they come across a barn full of freaking werewolves that want to eat them to death <laughs> one thing know? that i did that, that i was going to do and i don't i think the the game got canceled or something like that i threw sleepy hollow in the uh, middle of uh, Forgotten Realms, and I and I you and could I totally grabbed, throw that into Terranoth. You could throw it anywhere. It's, you really can. It's yeah. a small village, and headless horsemen, all that kind of stuff. You don't have to name it Sleepy Hollow, obviously. But if you have a dude running on a horse with no head, throwing a pump, flowing flaming pumpkins at you, yeah, baby. I fun. ran a, I ran a long term. Um, uh, Pathfinder campaign mm-hmm. uh, a couple of years ago. Okay. Well, I was more than a couple, but it was almost half a decade ago I ran this campaign, yeah. and it ran for about two years. But when we came to our first Halloween adventure for mm-hmm. that campaign, I had the up until then this had this has this adventure had nothing to do with the theme that was going through the general uh, campaign, which was about um, 
something completely different, but I had him come up across a, a, another farm scenario, but there was a haunted woods. <laughs> and this and coming out of this haunted woods were these um, ghosts that would or ghostly haunted pumpkin headed creatures yeah. that would come out and snatch people and drag them off into the night. Oh, and perfect. And yeah, it was it was real easy to do. Um but again, that's where you would use these kinds of rules in a temporary basis. Mm-hmm. I don't think these sanity rules are strong enough for a long term or for a for 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 a Cthulhu game, though. That's right. Why do you say that, Tony? <laughs> you didn't create well, anything or anything, did you? <laughs> I did. I I saw my deep madness coming up, and I wanted to have more robust sanity rules. Mm-hmm. Now I didn't use them because I was lazy, and I didn't get them done in time. Um, for the for the game for, so if you were playing in that game and you're like oh, I didn't know you were using new rules that's right I didn't use them <laughs> <laughs> but this is uh, these rules are to be used as a supplement to the Genesis Horror Tone rules on page 242 of the core rule book I don't know why I wrote 235 in my notes but um, the, ca- <laughs> the characters receive a, in mind the characters receive a sanity rating now this is only if you're going to run Cthulhu-esque horror this works really well. I don't see anywhere else it would work really well. Um, so first off, so people who aren't familiar with Cthulhu as core, what do you mean? What do you mean well, by that? I know a lot of people might be, but we're just okay. We're, Cthulhu, what do you mean by that? Cthulhu S. Core comes from the works of H.P. Lovecraft, an author from the 1920s, and he wrote stories that were about people who lose grip with reality, about ancient horrors returning to the world, and and these things were so unfathomably scary that they caused you to mentally break. The more you learned about them. Right. The more you learned about them, mm-hmm. just reading about them would cause you to lose sanity. Mm-hmm. Learning about their magic and how it worked would cause you to lose sanity. Seeing any of these creatures would cause you to lose sanity. Mm-hmm. Um, sanity is a big deal in that. It's 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 a very strong element in that Cthulhu-esque horror type right. game. Um, I would even argue that um, some of the more modern sci-fi stuff that you see out there is Cthulhu-esque. I use the movie uh, Aliens or uh, Event Horizon. Those are great example of Cthulhu-esque horrors mm-hmm. in a futuristic setting. You can do Cthulhu-esque in a futuristic, a which I did. I did it in a futuristic underwater setting for my mm-hmm. deep madness. Um, you can do it in a modern setting, but most of the time it's run in the 1920s era. Mm-hmm. Either way, this set of rules that I came up with kind of captures that sanity. It's about terror. It's about degrading sanity over time. Right. And basically when we were talking about embracing your NPCs, taking that quote unquote journey down, (laughs) down the, um, you know, the heart into the heart of darkness where they're losing their mind. This is what we're talking about. Yeah. And 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 you, you said it, you said NPCs, but you really meant PCs, right? Yes, I meant pieces. Exactly, <laughs> okay. your player right. characters. That's right. All right. So to finish here, or to continue here, I mm-hmm. so these are the way my sanity's rules rules work. Now I have these up on the MiWi. These have been up as a a free resource for people to read that joined us over there uh, mm-hmm. up until now. But I'm going to put them up on Facebook and probably up on the FFG and, form. And uh, Chris is going to put them in the show notes. I don't know if I'm going to put them on the FFG forums. Maybe not right away. I want to. I want to play test them a little bit some more before True. I do that. Sure. Um, but this is for you and your group to play test if you want to try and run a one shot Cthulhu uh, horror, Cthulhu esque horror. And you know what, folks? If you find that they are too powerful or not powerful, nasty enough, send me a Let note. Us know. Yeah, 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 definitely. Give me some feedback. But to finish here, you're, so basically, I give characters a sanity rating. That sanity rating is a derived stat, like your, like your, um, wounds. Uh, your wounds and your strain. Now, originally, I had it written as willpower, and I still do in my original notes. But I'm still thinking it should be intellect because I'd hate to have another stat get end up being a double down stat. What I mean by is, if you raise your willpower, your strain threshold and your strain, your sanity threshold go up. I'm I don't thinking. Know. I'm thinking intellect might end up being where I go, just to, because uh, you know it is the academics in the Cthulhu-esque setting who always seem to be mm-hmm. the ones able to handle it more than 
the people with a strong will. I could see that. I, I, I think I could see that. So I, I think I mm-hmm. might just go with intellect instead of willpower. But right Sounds now it good. stays at willpower. And um, so the way this works is at least one sanity is lost every time a character fails a, sheer, a fear check. The character will also lose sanity equal to a monster's ranks in madness talent when they first encounter that monster. Now, a monster, as ranks in its madness talent, determine how many dice are... Okay, so the madness talent. I'll go over that. This is a new talent. It is tier one. It's passive. It's ranked. It can be taken by adversaries only. Mm-hmm. And, and actually, I put it as monster only. So it's only really someone who is like highly mutated or a actual supernatural horror or something like that. You don't want to give it to a bad guy. Um, yeah. This uh, madness talent is basically essentially the same as the adversary talent, except for it only applies to fear checks. Yep. You up for every rank in madness, you upgrade the fear check once per rank in madness, and then also when a player fails a fear check, they f- lose mad uh, lose sanity equal to the ranks in madness. So, if you're character has failed a check against a creature with madness three they're going to lose three sanity mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so Makes yeah sense. it's a it's a big hit too i, yeah. I lose three sanity in one hit Ooh, it's going to be bad and yeah. there's a reason for that when a character loses five sanity in one session and for every point lost after that they begin and continue to crack mentally and must roll on the insanity tables. Mm-hmm. Now, my insanity tables are just like the uh, critical hit table in the Genesis book. There, it's percentile dice, um, but they're rolled a little differently. Insanities are rolled and accumulated similar to critical hits. That each accumulative insanity, uh, but it's a little different in that each accumulative insanity adds plus. 20% to the roll. And mm-hmm. at the end of a session, this number sets resets back to zero automatically. So the way that works is that normally if you have a critical hit, no matter whether it carries from session to session to session, you always are going to add plus 10% to the next critical hit you roll uh, that is rolled against you. Uh, in, in this case, if you made it through a session and you got down, you dropped sanity, but you didn't die or you didn't go insane and you're going into another session, you know, maybe you're playing a four-part game or a three-part game, you're going into another session, that, that plus at the end of the session, whether you have two, one, ten insanities, doesn't matter, mm-hmm. it, it wipes back to zero for the next session. Gotcha. All right. Okay, and then when a character runs out of sanity, they pass out and remain so until the end of the encounter. After the encounter is over, they will awaken with one sanity. Uh, Lastly, characters recover sanity at a rate of once per week of rest and relaxation, or one per session of psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. That's harsh. Which it should be. It is, yeah. It's going to be if you're going to run a campaign, you want it to be hard for the characters to regain their sanity. So I have a uh, question, real quick. Yep. Yeah. And I didn't really. I'm sorry, I didn't ask before. It didn't really strike me until you explaining it and me reading it, kind of at the same time. Mm-hmm. Going back up to where they lose five sanity in one session, and you say for every point lost after that. So let's say I have a hard fear check that I fail fail the first one, I gain three sanity. Mm-hmm. Lose three sanity. Correct. Or, or gain three insanity. I don't know. One uh, of the two. You, you lose three sanity. You lose Go three on. sanity. Okay. <laughs> and say I, I say I have to make another hard check and I fail that one. My I've now lost six sanity. Mm-hmm. Now you say for every point after that. Now do I is this going to be two rolls? You're going to roll once at plus 20%. Roll once at 20% because I've lost one point over five. Yep. So let's say I, so then, so then let's say I fail a third one at hard. Yeah, same. I will add, I will now make a check at plus 80%. Yeah. Holy buckets. That's great. (laughs) (laughs) That is nuts. 
But the chart goes well above 100. percent There's sure a reason. Does. It goes, it goes up, almost to 200. Yeah, 91 plus gone. Yeah. Mental death. So yeah, there's a reason for that. Okay, yeah. but okay. And then I also have in here. Furthermore, threat and advantage and despair and triumph can be no, can be used normally as per the horror tone rules in Genesis, the, uh, and they are used to narrate the character's ability to men- mentally comprehend that which they are seeing. If two or more threat or despair is rolled. That means the character fails to function normally for that round, and their mind, as their mind attempts to grapple with the otherworldly horror before them. If they roll two or advantage or a triumph, that means the character reacts rationally and undaunted in this instance. Um, yeah. Oh so if they fail and they roll in between there, which I didn't put in my notes, but I probably should. If they roll only a single advantage, single threat, or no advantage or threat, they will continue with a setback die. Gotcha. I need an updated version of this. Yeah. From you, I think. Cool. Yeah, I, yeah, this is my most most recent. I, I didn't put that Very in my cool. original, and I don't have that in. But anyhow. No, this so, is good. So the insanity table. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to go over it briefly. You have uh, zero, to one, zero to 10% is just chills. They suffer strain. So it's additional strain above and beyond all that you've given them. They have chills running up and down their spine. No big deal. 11 to 20%. They're overly cautious. The character can only act during the last initiative slot or on their next turn that they go. Um, so they're really just, no, nah, I don't know if I want to do anything. <laughs> I'll yeah. be back here. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Right. 21 to 30%. Jumpy. The character is jumpy and nervous and receives a setback die on their next check. Simple as that. Um mm-hmm. 31 to 40 percent dread move one story point to the gm's pool awesome <laughs> that's great immediately 41 to 50 percent beyond words the character cannot take any actions or maneuvers that require speech oh no casting spells yeah 51 to 60 percent scared stiff the character is immobilized and staggered until oh. they're next they can't move and they can't act. Oh, <laughs> okay, great. That is all just what I call the uh, the brief shocks. <laughs> then we move into the temporary disorders. Um, Sixty-one to seventy-five percent knocked flat. The character falls prone, suffers two strain. They then they will attempt to crawl away in terror for their next maneuver. They can still act normally, but their terror causes them to crawl away while doing so. Yep. Nice. All right. Uh, 76 to 90%. Delusional. The character inverts, invents a temporary, a new temporary reality in which they cope mentally with what they are seeing. They increase the difficulty of all roles for the remainder of the encounter. Increase. Increase. <laughs> because they're, you know, it's not upgrade. That's not making rest- a purple a red. That's adding another purple. Did you did you guys see that big gorilla in that room? No, that's a werewolf, dude. We saw a werewolf. No, that was just a big gorilla. That was just a gorilla, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked nice. Ninety one percent to one hundred and five percent incoherent. The character is only capable of babbling, laughing, or weeping for the rest of the encounter and cannot speak. Wow. 106 to 120 percent. Abject terror. The character must use all maneuvers and actions to flee the source of their fear or remove removing obstacles that prevent them from doing so, including other characters. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, this next one is TPK material, man. Yeah. For sure. 121 to 135. Frozen in fear. The character is staggered until the end of the encounter. Wow. Wow. (laughs) Then we move into the permanent effects. 136 to 150%. Paranoid. So these temporary disorders and the brief shocks, that's if... They're all encounter-based or a turn or two. So the brief shocks are a turn or two. Gotcha. and if you want to add some to these guys, feel mm-hmm. free. There's large chunks of of, of percentages. percentages here that if you feel like you want to add something in there, go right ahead. Feel free. I'm not. I don't take ownership of this. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the no. Um, the way it is is the brief shocks are an account, uh, a, a a round a, or two. Round or two. Okay. The temporary disorders are end of the for the entire encounter. For the encounter. Okay. For the most part, other than the first yeah. one. Yeah. True. Um, and then 
the permanent madnesses. These are permanent. Mm-hmm. This is forever for you and your character. This isn't a. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go to a psychological. I'm gonna have some psychologist make a roll and try and remove one of these. This is still the end. Yes. <laughs> All right, till the end of their days. Nice. Okay, yes. let's go over those. Permanent madness. Paranoid. This is 136 to 150 percent. Upgrade the difficulty of all social roles. <laughs> Forever. Because you guys know paranoid. Yeah. That's awesome. 151 to 165. Cursed. The character downgrades all skill checks to a minimum of one. Oh. All skill checks. Oh. Now downgrade, again, that means making a yellow a green, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Always. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you may have three ranks in ranged and a four agility. Still rolling two yellow and two, two green. Yeah. Because, oh, oh, no. Nice. Permanent downgrade to a minimum of one. To a minimum of one <laughs> yeah. green, right? Yep. Wow. Okay. 166 to 180. Memory, lo- memory loss. The character loses all ranks in all skills, but one, as they revert back to a childlike state. What the heck? Oh. Oh, dude. It's harsh. <laughs> I know. Harsh. <laughs> all right. 181 to 190%. Disassociated. Reroll all character motivations and choose a new name, and the character may rearrange their skill points at the GM's discretion. <laughs> so you're adding a. No, you're replacing you're, your current person. You're somebody else. <laughs> you're somebody else now. <laughs> Nice. And, and and I wanted one in there that was a kind of a fun effect. Mm-hmm. So that's why that one's in there. Mm-hmm. You, you really aren't losing anything with that one, but you could really have a lot of fun narratively with that. Oh, you, you can. Know, um, oh, yeah. Inst- instead of being, you know, Grog, you know, instead of being mm-hmm. uh, Killzak, the dwarven dragon hunter, now <laughs> yep. you're, you're Mrs. Nesbitt, the tea mistress. I don't know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> as a GM, you should totally determine I think in that case, yeah. the the GM should determine where the, all those skill points go and kind of lead you into becoming right. somebody who you would never be. You know, you know, to be honest with you, I'm wondering if you might want to swap memory loss and disassociated. Keep the percentages, but just swap them. Swap their places? Yeah, because disassociated, that's 166 to 180. There's uh-huh. a little bigger chance for that. And then memory loss, that's like one level from this last one, which is... <laughs> 191% to plus. wherever. Plus. Yep. Gone. Mental death. Your character is a gibbering vegetable and, or kills himself. Well, that's what my character the other night did. Hrothgar, my little halfling barbarian. Yeah. He was intellectually devoured. <laughs> that's right. pretty well, what it was. I'm going to do that. I'm going to move I'm disassociated. Yeah, and swap, memory. I think you swap them. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'll tell you, memory loss is harsh, dude. All ranks and all skills but one. That's okay. crazy. Well, see, look, I just took okay. feedback from a, a, a listener, <laughs> my partner here. Yeah, I'm listening to you. You know it. <laughs> and, and applied it. See, folks, it does work. Yes, I, I, do, sure I do. I do. I will change my uh, my mind with new evidence. <laughs> <laughs> so 166 to 180. Yeah, dude. Yeah, so that's some um, – dude, I like these. These are pretty good. Now, again, everybody, you're all thinking – I think Tony has lost a little bit of ins- ins- uh, has has lost sanity creating these, but you know what? You kind of got to. And these are the things. These are the things when we're talking about buying into it, letting it happen as a player, letting your characters take these journeys down the cursed road or this disassociated result, <laughs> where you create a completely new character, basically. And oh yeah, that, that would be fun. That would be fun. And I know you guys are thinking, dude, you are weird. <laughs> but, you know, that's what we're talking about here. <laughs> this is kind of these are the kinds of concepts and things that that, that we're talking about where you kind of have to think outside the box, maybe think in ways you probably not have played the game in ways you might not have played a game that for us is fun and it's all about fun, right? Cuz if you fun you mm-hmm. win. I mean, if you're having fun, you win at role-playing games. If anybody tells you you can't win at role-playing games, tell them, then you're not doing it right. If you're not having fun, you're not you're not winning. But if you are, but but if you do have fun, you win. And that's ah. what we're talking here. So this These is, games are no fun. What are you talking about? This would just be fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, right. so that's cool, dude. I've made that change. I don't, know if, I don't know if I have anything to add on top of these rules. I I like it. I do. I do. 
Now, do you think the now because you originally orig- started the discussion with me about the plus twenty percent versus plus ten percent? Um, as far as the, it's one of the like you said. I think it's a play testing kind of thing. So if hey, any of you any of you are out there want to grab these play test, hey, is this is the twenty percent? Does that work, or should it be just ten percent or whatever? I don't know. Um, at first, I didn't think, but then I looked at your tables, and because it goes up to one hundred and ninety. 191 and i guess you might be able to that might be one of those dials right like if you want a if it's run if you're running a shorter campaign a shorter adventure see i was thinking this is really for one shots yeah then maybe the 20 percent makes sense but hey if you want to run a long term kind of cthulhu-esque investigative type of campaign maybe you dial it to 10 10% 10% adding it, and, and you won't get... Add in a few more effects. Add in a few more effects or something, too. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, again, it's... Um, I think what you have here is a great basis for a new sanity or insanity rules, however you want to think about it. Yeah. I mean, you're okay. calling it a, a sanity rating. That's great. And you lose your sanity as you go. As you're failing these fear checks, which makes sense. <laughs> Did I just... Was that... <laughs> Does it make sense? I don't know. So, yeah. So but this, is, good, this is... Yeah, this is mainly, again, like for those supernatural Cthulhu-esque horror games. And and, and, mm-hmm. and I just wanted to prove, basically I did it because we had a little show that we showed up on. Yes, uh, we did. A, a, a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Or no, it was last week. Um, that we went on to the RPG brewery and discussed, because someone said that Genesis couldn't do this. Mm-hmm. And I had to prove them wrong. And the question was, what can't Genesis do? And I'm actually going to put a link to that show. We were Tony and I were on the RPG brewery for that a couple mm-hmm. weeks, a couple Tuesdays ago, and I'll put a link. I think it's up on YouTube. I'll put a link in our show notes for that if you guys want to watch that. It was about an hour long, but actually went a little long, about an hour and fifteen minutes. And that is not safe for work. <laughs> so I think we were in rare form that night, weren't we? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So beware of um, that one. So yeah, and in the in in this case, you know, you're. I, I forget what I was going to say. Damn it. <laughs> I'm totally lost. It's all good. I say, I say, I say, Tony, here's 50 pieces of awesome, buddy. Oh, my God. I get 50 pieces of awesome. Rules. Heck yeah, oh, you do. Thanks, man. buddy. You, you created these <laughs> insanity rules for not only me, but for everybody out there listening to this. Oh. You know, and if you're not listening, you won't know where to find it. Yeah. And you probably didn't hear what I just said if you're not listening, so it really doesn't matter. Right? I know what I was going to talk about. <laughs> okay, see, there you go. If I just start I'm rambling. Glad I did. Good. I'm glad I didn't because you you gave me 50 pieces of awesome, which I wasn't expecting. So I I'm going to take I'm going to take my 50 pieces of awesome, go to the awesome store and get some awesome sauce, <laughs> and maybe carry it over into our next section. This is setting the tone. Let's do it. Welcome to Setting the Tone. This used to be where Chris and I talked about our settings that we were working on. But, you know, the setting fever has kind of subsided. Everybody's kind of made what they want to make or is kind of taking a break from that. Or mm-hmm. or in the case of us with our Primordial Machina, we're going to be doing that on air for you folks over a series of, of podcasts. Mm-hmm. So we've decided to turn this into kind of a... Uh, a brief talk about the settings that are out there. We're going to cover elements of right now, Terranoth. I'm going over little bits of the book that we think uh, you folks should get to know mm-hmm. the setting, teaching you about the settings themselves. Yep. Um, and I think you know, we might, I think we were talking about maybe even talking a little bit of, about the world of Android too, because there's a book out for that, which right. it's not the, an official Genesis setting book, but there's so many good nibbits of information in there. That would definitely, it's getting me excited for the Android. Right. And I uh, think uh, we'll probably alternate. We'll probably do Terran off mm-hmm. one week. Bit, we'll maybe, yeah. we'll maybe do, uh, and if we hear anything else coming down the pipe, maybe they're going to do an Arkham Horror or maybe they're going to do uh, Tannhauser yeah. or uh, Twilight Imperium. We'll add those to this and we'll do little bits on those worlds talking about those settings and playing in them. Absolutely. 
So today we are going to cover the origins of Terranoth. This mm. is the basically the world creation myth of Terranoth. Yes. Uh, Which it, it can like. be, yeah, it can be found in pages twenty four and twenty five of Realms of Terranoth. But mm-hmm. if you wanna, if you don't know, and if you don't have the book, this is really for you. We're gonna tell you about Terranoth. Maybe try and drag you into that setting, or maybe <laughs> you can take this into your game world and go with it. Whichever. Drag you kicking and screaming, damn it! <laughs> so see, you see what I did there? Yeah, I did the it. Whole horror. I did. Thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I love it. So in in the myths of creation here, they talk about the first. Well, wait a second. Who talks oh. about the first now? Okay. This is yeah. actually what I do like. I love it when they do when 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 writers and settings do this, uh-huh. where this is actually compiled by Alana of Great Haven. I so thought it was Alanya. Alan, it would be Alanya, but I'm a dwarf and I say Alanya. No, sorry. All <laughs> <laughs> right, flying yeah. kills act. <laughs> That's right. Hey, don't spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it is Elania. Yep, it's a redneck dwarf. I'm just saying. Okay, go on. Sorry, <laughs> he kind of does, doesn't he? <laughs> um, anyways, but yeah, it says it's a brief. It's Tales of Darkness, a brief compendium of historical learning, as compiled by Elania of Greyhaven. So that's kind of neat. That's kind of neat when I say it, when they do that. So Greyhaven, if you don't know, is one of the free cities, and it's the one that has the university in it. The mm-hmm. University of Greyhaven, where they teach magic and higher learning. That's right, where um, all the wizards so, go. Yeah, this would be a, from a basically from a place that's a great um, conclave of knowledge and and yes. higher learning. Mm-hmm. So uh, they have this section called the Myths of Creation. Yes. Now um, she talks briefly about how uh, she doesn't believe the elves who told her all this stuff. <laughs> she thinks they're haughty and that they don't know this stuff because they weren't even created yet. How do they know this stuff? But then she goes to tell it anyway. So <laughs> exactly, this is kind of what they said. This is kind of what we learned. This is what's been written down. <laughs> yeah, I so love the, way it, the the mentality of it. It's like I know everything, and the elves don't know everything. I think they're just jackasses. You know, yeah. like I, <laughs> exactly. I like red. Um, so but, this uh, Timorian, so this Timorian Loken, Timoran, Timoran Lokander, Lokander, Lokander. Did, did he write this a uh, mad this legendum magicara? The magicara. Uh, this is like so. It says to my memory, the legendum magicara corroborates much Alvin legend, and whose word should. And whose word should we trust more than that of its author? Oh, duh. Yeah, he did write it, though. <laughs> yes, Tim which actually, wrote Which actually, I kind of like I kind of like this next sentence, too. Should you ever be lucky enough to come across a collection of, this, of his thesis, be sure to compare your notes with the wisdom therein, for it has been many years since I had the fortune to study it. Yeah. So, yeah. Tim Aran was... We'll get into that later in okay. later sections of this book, but he was like this ultimate awesome, powerful wizard, which I think is great because I mean you shorten the guy's name and he's Tim, <laughs> Tim the Enchanter. That's right. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, no, he uh, Timoran Lockhander, he kind of unlocked the mysteries of magic Sweet. way back then. Um, he also kind of helped. Right. Usher in one of the three darknesses, but we'll get into that. And she says um, he's not necessarily always the finest judge of character either. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's because funny. well, it was because one of his apprentices ends up becoming the leader of one of the major darknesses that take on the world, which, which is why they call this the Tales of Darkness. Because the, exactly. the 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 key things about Terranoth are that it's this beautiful fantasy world. But it's had three major horrible things, events that have happened in the past, and they call them the three darknesses. Which but we'll get we're into. not covering that today. Today we're covering the creation, creation of it. Right. Right. So it goes into talking about the first. Mm-hmm. What is the first? Well, there, there's really before there's really any physical form or anything like that or time. Before time existed, before dreams existed, before really anything, there were the first. The first were some sort of consciousness power. beyond understanding, some sort of even, power. Even beyond gods. They created the gods. 
So beyond yes. that, so if you so, could basically, so if you could, yeah, yeah, this creationism, nope. that's kind of where it's, what we're talking about here. Right. And so the... the they have no form. The, yeah, they had, they, had no, they had no form. Mm-hmm. Um, they had no gender. They were just known as the first. Mm-hmm. Um, they had greater potential than even the mightiest of gods because they could just think things into reality. Um, yeah. So, greater. Uh, yeah. They lack personality and form. Basically, this is the 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 game's way, the world's way of um, into existence. Yeah, everything kind of comes into existence because of this beginning intelligence. Right. And they created and, and they created this thing called the void. Yeah. Which is where everything that was created is going to start filling up here for us, and we're going to walk you through that. Right. <clears throat> now, uh, legends are not clear as to whether the void came into being because of the first, with the first, or before the first. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so the void was there, mm-hmm. and then, and then they decided to, without breath or tongue or lips, the first are said to have uttered songs or poems that shaped the void defining its potential and giving birth to all things. These verses described the ideal forms and natures. Elves insist that the echoes of the lays, as they can be called, can be heard to this day in the rhythms of nature. They say that the sounds of these songs nourish spell, uh, spirits like food, and it is in this tradition that the wield weavers work their craft, which that's another whole segment on the whale, on the wheel weavers. Yeah, that's kind of confused me a little bit again, but but I like <laughs> that dude. They're singing these songs, and what what's the new skill that they added? Verse. Yeah. To yeah. this, it automatically know. creates this image of this just thinking a poem, and therefore it takes form. Yeah. And mm-hmm. okay, so there's a sidebar here. I like that. I sidebar. think is really cool because. Mm-hmm. So, uh, the Earth rites, as they're, they're it's it's spelled Y R T H W R I G T H or G H T. Sorry, right. <laughs> and, and you, so it's and Earth rite. Right, Earth. You know, they just spell Earth with a Y R T H, and rites would be like to build. Right. So they built the Earth. They actually these earth rites built what's called they call the mortal realm and who are these earth rites dude they're hatched they were hatched because they're ultimately fucking huge ass powerful dragons yeah they called them dragonkin yes mm-hmm. they were dragons before dragons gave were given form they were yes. they were um, basically if you're thinking D&D mentality this is Bahamut and Tiamat you know mm-hmm. this Io. is actually it'd be Io actually it Yes, I O. I think that's. I think Biamut and and um, they are the son and daughter of Io. Io, yes. right, right, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a, this whole section on them, and 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 it automatically they it, the the author takes a adversarial tone to that because the dragons <laughs> ended up being one of the darknesses. So it's immediately <laughs> like, yeah, I have to mention them here because mm-hmm. they need to be mentioned here, but I don't want to. You know? <laughs> so yep. the, that's really kind of cool the way they talk about that and, and how they, the dragons um, uh, in a manner reminiscent to the lays of the first uh, created the rune magic that gives mm-hmm. uh, another, of you said that the the lays of the first are songs and poems that yeah. oh hey verse verse has been around since the beginning of creation well guess what then right after the beginning of creation along came the earth rites and created rune magic yep basically yeah so they created what what they call the mortal realm or firma drachium yeah drachium yeah yeah which Drac- is the drachum which is the spinning bodies planets and suns. Yeah. You know, um, basically, it's it's existence as we perceive it. That's right. what these guys have created. That's what they created, and they're called the Foundrakes, also known as what we called the Earth Earthrites. Yep, yep. So okay. that's cool. So, so for- then we go over to page twenty five, where mm-hmm. we talk about the three, three planes, planes of power. And what are those? 
So they created first the Empyrean realm. The Empyrean realm is basically heaven. Yeah. It's your it is a the the highest of the uh, the planes of power. It is the plane of perfection. The elves legends talk about f- the four spheres that make up the Empyrean realm. Mm-hmm. These are light, air, life, and dreams. Mm-hmm. These spheres exist in such an unadulterated form in the Empyrean realm that the cares of hunger, age, and discomfort are utterly unknown there. It's, it's heaven. heaven. It's heaven, yeah, exactly. It's a plane <laughs> of existence. And there's another... So the, the next plane, which they call a, a, one of the lowest planes of power, is the... The Eternal. other side of the coin. Other yeah. side of the coin, the infernal. <laughs> And um, now they say, which I in, think is cool that they did. They, ins- they they took the infernal, but they spelled it differently yes. and weird. Y-N-F- so it's Y N. Sorry, go ahead. Yep, Y N F E R N A E L. Infernal. So infernal. 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 And the spheres. So so the spheres um, of um, ex- of power or whatever you want to call them. You know, were light air, life, dreams in heaven, or the Empyrean, um, the plane of perfection, here we have darkness, pain, death, and hunger. <laughs> kind of the oh, opposite, yeah. Which is yeah. groovy. Oh. And it is. And it says here that the infernal realm is a dismal place populated by monstrous entities that crave to visit torture and degradation upon mortals. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah every demon stuff. every demon you could come up with. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. Then there's a third one. Uh, between them. Which lies the, between them. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And that's the side of the coin. Mm-hmm. Um, the Einlong or the Einlong is pronou- uh, how it's pronounced. I'm not sure. It's A E N L O N G. Um, I, I call it the Einlong. Um, mm-hmm. the, it was formed, the realm to which the plane of physical existence was is connected. So it's basically like your astral plane. The Ainlong is a spiritual plane, however, believed to be the same as the fabled gray lands spoken of in practices of dreamwalkers, which I don't know what all that's about. Yet, but, but over time, the Ainlong be, uh, became full of refuse of creation, half tangible, unfinished things. So basically, if you think like a cross between the ethereal and the astral plane in your old D and D cosmologies, mm-hmm. um, it connects the infernal and the Empyrean and reality itself. Right, and I think, and I think you had the um, what is it like the elemental elemental planes were kind of in there too. That was kind of the right. The wheel right. of the planes. Right. That's kind of where. So everything that's left over, <laughs> the derbus of every of the the good and bad, is like <laughs> now in there, right? <laughs> right. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's kind of neat. Which which is compl- which is different from the mortal realm. The mortal. Pl- ex- they, they don't even have them. They call it like a mortal realm. Yeah. It's not like a plane of existence. It's just here's the stuff. Yeah. Okay. The cool. mortal realm. So mm-hmm. you could do very much do like a. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could probably flesh out solar systems in that mortal realm, and have a Starfinder campaign in the realms of Terranoth type exactly. thing. Well, that's what. It, yeah, because so, it's spinning bodies, planets, and suns. Yes. Yes. You, can, you might even be able to do, dare I say, the expanse in Terranoth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> So next is setting them in motion the Verto Magica, uh, which I love the the terms in this. This is awesome. Mm-hmm. The, the, the the first set into motion the Verto Magica, which may have you may have heard as to as the, may be referred to as the turning, according to Elven sources, to create the Verto Magica. The first employed a sort of spiritual mechanism Ooh. involving the rise and fall of the Imperial Empyrean and Infernal realms. Basically, they set the whole thing in motion. Without the Verto Magica, everything would be in a fixed place, and time would stand still. So they created time, which is the turning of the realms. Yeah, and that's what Verto means in Latin. Yes. To rotate. Ah. Whoa! I, I, my, you just blew my mind, man. Didn't I, though? My Google <laughs> Foo is awesome, by the way. <laughs> uh, it says you may re- raise objection here. In that the early myths implied existence of such things as movement and the passage of time. After all, the void existed before all elves did. Right? But 
<laughs> Perhaps a purely spiritual existence does not require such things as a distinction between the figurative and the literal. Right. <laughs> Ooh, right. So, <laughs> so okay. basically the first basically had to jumpstart it. <laughs> yep. So Time, they created right? everything and then they said, okay, set it in motion. Exactly. And they they and gave it a good spin, right? <laughs> yep. They spun the wheel. Yeah, they did. Or the glow, uh, right? <laughs> and they put their finger on it. So what's so next? That, oh, so what's next? So then we have... Um, so once the Einlong was established, we have these primordial creatures called the Fae and the Demora. Mm-hmm. Now the Fae are those creatures that exist in the... Um, you know they're like the wild and hostile and rarely seen things where the where the fae are at home in the air and the demora are at home in the earth. I per- so I kind of liken it to like your seely and unseely fairies. Your okay. fae are kind of lighter. They're 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 your fairies. They're your um you know your typical things with wings that flitter around and are happy. Your Dimora are more dark. They're no. un- unseely things hidden in the earth. Actually, I think they're both dark and wild and um, hostile. Un- Could be. And unpredictable. And unpredictable. I think both are. Some are seen in nature, which are the Fey, and the Dimora are more of your earth-based versions of those. You know what I mean? Okay. So you, you know, so I liken it to um, I don't know if anybody out there has played that shift that D shift seven D game or not, <laughs> where we're talking about like the Feywild, if mm-hmm. you will. You know yeah. how they created all these you know trickster gnomes or trickster fairies and such like that, which but they are kind of ruthless in a way. They yeah. can. Oh, be. they're you know never I mean? their their goals are separate from. Absolutely. Uh, if everyone else's. They're kind of unfathomable in the right. way they, they take amusement in the pain of others. All yeah. even the most even the most harmless <laughs> of fairies is scary. Mm-hmm. And this is and this and they live in that spiritual plane. That's what the Enlong was. They're in that spiritual plane. So you can so they may come into the realm of Tiernoth. I know I mean we're running Stefan is running us through the realms of Tiernoth and that adventure on Thursday nights, right? On the mm-hmm. uh, RPG mm-hmm. brewery and such. And that wood that we're in, the timing is all off, right? Time is goes by faster in there. We've met these Fae because well, it's it's connected to this Einlong. And it's, I don't know, I think that's cool. Well, that's it's, because if you look at the sidebar here on 25, mm-hmm. you have the River Tyre and the Dark Wood. The the river Tyre and the okay the dark wood is a roaming dark wood, is one of is one such location. Okay, so it talks about these locations, mm-hmm. um, as being not really in a realm, but not really connect, uh, disconnected. They connect all things very much like the river Styx flows through time and through space, mm-hmm. in in mythology and in, in D Shift Seven D. It flows through all the realms. Very much the river Tyre is also kind of that border between. Uh, the the Empyrean lands. and the Enlong. That's what it says. The, the river Enlong. is said to form a border between the Empyrean and the Enlong. And I see the Darkwood as being that border between the Enlong and potentially this mortal realm. Right? Yeah. That's the that's Feywild. Really Basically, kind of... it's a Feywild. From, yes, it is. From 4th edition or whatever, 3rd edition, whenever that came out, right? It has no fixed position and it moves around. So mm-hmm. you may be in the Darkwood. I'm just saying... I'm pretty sure we are. Stefan, if we are, <laughs> you're brilliant. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> but yeah, but, uh, this, this is pretty cool stuff, man. So this is just uh, this little bit on the creation. Next time we might go into the elves themselves and talk about them, or maybe we'll skip to another spot in the book. Um, I don't feel like we have to just like go from beginning to end with the book. I think we'll just pick no. pieces that we like. Yeah. Maybe next time we'll do an Android setting. But this is how we're going to do setting the tone from here on out, folks, um, mm-hmm. until either we have something to put back in it the old way or we find something new that mm-hmm. we'd rather do. Yeah, I mean, we do have we do have other settings in the core rules, too. We can even pull apart one of those 
you know, we've got that, um, the modern day, we have, what is it, that space opera, uh, Twilight Imperium, which is how yeah. Fantasy Flight got their, got their start with the Twilight Imperium game. Yeah. So, sweet. But I've done enough reading. I've done enough talking about tearing off. I really want to go over and do something else. Oh, I know what you want to do, man. I've been chomping at the bit to do this. I know. Let's. <laughs> All right, then, folks. We're heading over to Advantageous Threats. Yay! All right, everybody. Time for your favorite part of the show and ours. Yeah. So I guess that's, I mean, is it your favorite part of the show? It's mine. Us? Why don't you email us and let us know whether it is or not. It is mine, too, actually. I really <laughs> like this part. So, Tony, why don't you go first, man? Okay. So today, sticking with our theme, my character, Harvey Loudermilk, is an investigative reporter in a 1920s Arkham Horror setting. He has witnessed several horrible things this night and has already uh, has four sanity hits. Nice. So he has his um, his average will or average intellect, um, which is two plus eight. He had originally had an insanity threshold of ten. Mm-hmm. He's taken four. Uh, so. He just snuck into a warehouse to get evidence of some cultist meeting and ends up face-to-face with a night gaunt. Oof. His fear check is uh, his – it's going to be willpower plus discipline. Now, his willpower is two also because he's an average dude. Mm-hmm. He, has a, he has a discipline of one. Yep. So that is going to give him a one yellow, one green pool right now. Awesome sauce. Okay. However – a night gaunt is fucking scary as shit. This is a daunting check. Yeah, that's going to be four purple, dude. So this is four purple. However, <laughs> as a GM, I've given my night gaunt two ranks in madness. So that the makes, madness talent. So using my gonna, rules. Yep. So using Tony's rules, you're going to take two of those difficulty dice and upgrading those to challenge dice so it'll be two red two purple yep versus my one green one yellow would you like to add anything to that well let's see here um (laughs) i think that i think i think you've screwed yourself big time with this one this is going to be pretty nasty now is this harvey's first time sneaking into the dark is it Dark nighttime? Is this warehouse haunted? What? Nah, Harvey's snuck into all kinds of places. This is an investigative reporter. He's yeah, snuck yeah. into he's dark good. alleys and he's taking photos of of uh okay. you know husbands cheating on their wives and stuff like that before. He he's done this kind of stuff. I don't I don't necessarily think we need to really um punish Harvey any more than what it, what you're gonna do by rolling. All right. To be Harvey has Harvey has some, seen some things, and he he yes. understands. He's starting to understand that there is something darker going on. So he is prepared a little bit. He okay. has a charm that someone gave him. Nice. Um, and that charm kind of helps against fear checks, so it gives him a boost die. Oh, cool! I like that. And because he's holding that charm and he's putting a lot of faith in it, I'm going to sl- flip a story point and okay. go with. Uh, and I upgrade my other green die to a yellow. You know, I'm actually thinking, is this in the dark? Yes, it is. Okay. And is the night gaunt, is, he, is the night gaunt shining a, a flashlight underneath its face going boo? <laughs> no, <laughs> but so, it's so coming maybe, out of the shadows. It's, it's very close. So it's fairly, so it's fairly freaky there. The situation, the environment itself, would you consider that being, making it more freaky? Cause if so, maybe add a setback day. Cause it's already okay. in the dark, right? And, Ah, I dropped Shit my set out of the dark. There, I picked up another one. All right, I'm yeah. good. Rocking I just got to get that off the floor before one of the cats runs off with it here in a minute. All right. All right, I'm ready. Let's see. Let's do it. Hey, did you hear that? One of them went flying. Yay. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> all right, uh, I re-rolled it. So, first of all, Harvey failed. Uh, 
Um, yeah. You're going to have a net of one, two, three, four, five failures. So he what? failed on this check. So according to my rules, Harvey then takes Four his... insanity. No, two, because the creature's rating in madness is two. Oh, it's a rating in madness that he takes. It's not the fear check itself. Correct. Okay, it's a rating madness is what he'll take. Correct. On top of the one because he failed? He, it's just... It no, it increases. So it would be one if the creature had madness of one. It's one if it's any other failed check. If, if this becomes two, according to my rules that I wrote, so okay. it just becomes two. It, it doesn't it's add. Equal. It it doesn't add two to the already one because he failed the check. Correct. It just increases it to two. I understand. So, so that would be his fifth one plus one. <laughs> so he'd immediately <laughs> then roll on the insanity ta- or the mental trauma table as i've renamed it you'll notice from our show after we recorded chris and i kind of went through and <laughs> reworded some things right. um, to make it more um in line with genesis's core rules um including naming the uh, sanity stat to an insanity threshold and mm-hmm. you count up like wounds Instead and strain it. Right. And counting take uh losing them mm-hmm. so um sorry about that folks nope. but anyhow so why I don't roll. you roll? Why don't you roll okay. on that table, man? Come on, add forty percent right. to it. All right. Let's I'm see what going we get. To... I have the table up. <laughs> I'm Let's going see to... what Harvey gets. Okay, Harvey. Ooh, sixty-two plus oh. forty, one hundred and two. One hundred and two. He's incoherent. He's <laughs> babbling and laughing and weeping for the rest of the encounter and cannot speak. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> It'd be great when he runs back outside to get his driver to help. He's just going to run out and go... <laughs> Point the opposite direction. And there we go, everybody. <laughs> right. Well, that is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, Harvey was scared shitless. And That's that right. puts, him, puts him at six total uh, insanity. insanity. On his insanity oh, threshold of ten, of ten. Sweet. So, and then everyone he would add after that adds plus twenty percent. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So. Bye, Harvey. Harvey's yeah. done. Bye, bye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So myself. Uh, so, so was that it for your check? So you failed? Uh, Did you have any threat? Oh, I or? ended up I had three advantage, uh, in which case uh, hmm. Harvey was going to, or sorry, four advantage. So he was going to use an extra, uh, get a maneuver, a free maneuver to run the hell away. Perfect. <laughs> so, that's perfect. So run uh, out to his driver and go. I think that's a free maneuver. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he that was going is. to run the opposite direction. <sighs> Alrighty then. Yeah, well, <laughs> nothing but th- uh, I didn't roll anything other than failures on the negative dice, and I didn't roll anything other than advantage on the positive dice. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> awesome, <laughs> awesome. All right, all right. So my character named <laughs> Pimpernel Ditterdo. What? Yeah, <laughs> he's a halfling warlock. That's trying to hex a big bad evil guy at the end of a dungeon in a high fantasy setting. Basically, I, I made Pimpernel Ditter do over the weekend for my 5e game that my buddy's going to be running. And I wanted to see if he will work in Genesis, to be honest with you. And I, damn it, I came close, man. Okay. I can get the feel of this guy because I created him in 5e and I'm creating him in this. And I'm like, oh, he could be pretty cool. Okay, so Pimpernel. He's a sharp dude. He has he has an intellect of four. He has a three arcana. Mm-hmm. He has the signature ability, which is a curse at ranged using the doom um, setting. Right. So doom okay. doom allows you to change a die when somebody rolls. So whoever you're cursing, doom will allow you to change a die face on any die they roll to either a as long as it isn't a triumph or a despair. However, you could turn a blank challenge die face to a despair. Gotcha. Okay. So I'm hexing the bad guy for the group. He has a rune-encrusted rod 
i.e. Mm-hmm. a magic staff equivalent. Um, kind of, I trapped it as a rune encrusted rod, um, mm-hmm. which basically reduces the difficulty to uh, oh, so basically that check with his signature spell is going to be a daunting <laughs> difficulty. Yep, because curse is two. Yep, range is one. Yep, doom is and two. And dooms more. two more. Right, and then so signature... for a total of five, and then signature spell reduces that by one. Right now, got it. So my yep, and then. By casting this spell with my wand, I don't include the range difficulty, so I could reduce that to a hard. Okay. And then um, I'm assuming the big bad evil guy is probably adversary one or two. So well, if he's the BBEG at the end of a dungeon, yeah, he's adversary two. Absolutely, he is. Okay, so I'm going to have three yellow. A green. That three difficulty goes to two challenge dice and a difficulty die. Mm-hmm. And what else do we have there? So I have three yellow, a green, two red, and a purple. What else do I want to add to this? Um, I'm thinking. Um, I'm thinking because this is the first curse. He's really tossed out in a long time. I'm going to use a story point and upgrade it. Okay. To curse this guy. Well, as a GM, you're fighting a BBEG and you're trying to you're trying okay. to curse him. Yeah. He yeah. will definitely as a GM, I would always upgrade this if I had one. Absolutely. So I'll flip a story point and I'll upgrade it as well. I don't even need a, a narrative reason why. Because it's um, a yeah, yeah, BBEG at the end. It's it's the dungeon ender. Mm-hmm. It is. And let's see what happens here. If, if we get a despair or not. So four yellow, three uh-huh. red, everybody. All right, here we go. Oh, you're going to love this, Tony. You are going to love it. I sense despair in your future. I, <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> However, comma, <laughs> I you... succeeded with one success. Okay. I had a yellow. I had, um, basically, I had um, my... What is it? Proficiency dice? Mm -hmm. Cancel a challenge die. Both two of them did. I had two successes, two two um two two failures. I had one advantage, one success, one one um failure, one threat on another die. One of my yellows came up blank, probably my story point. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then I had and I'm left with oh actually oh no I failed because this despair counts as a failure. Yes, it do. Yep, so I failed with a despair. Okay. Well. <laughs> Pimpernel, no! Uh, your curse. Yes. You cast it, and at the last second, the the bad guy lifts up a shiny object, mirror. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And your spell strikes the mirror and comes back at you. Oh! I'm the one that's cursed. I'm doomed. I'm doomed. You are cursed, yes. That's perfect, that's... dude. Oh, that's great. All right. All right. That's awesome. That was that was easy. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. All right. Well, cool, dude. Yeah, that, that was fun, fun though. That was So, fun. yeah. Just to give you an example of how my fear fear rules work in a system, plus you also have kind of got in fear involved in the curse thing there with Chris did. Something along the um, line, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could totally – the doom effect. Um, mm-hmm. That's a, that's that's one you could even have characters. If they get hit with a doom effect, you could have them make a fear check after they get it. There you because go. Because they're, they're feeling just terrified and they feel this impending doom. Yes, so, they do. Um. Cool. Folks, that's it for Advantageous Threats. That is. Well done, man. Well done. All right. All right. You want to be ready to end this? Yeah, let's go home. Okay. Shoot it. Let's do it. Okay. So, everybody, thanks for listening. Um, I want to give a shout-out to the Barbarian himself, Matt Stark, and his Thoughts of a Barbarian blog, um, who has also made the transition to MeWe, My Way, MeWoo, Hoodoo. <laughs> I don't know Mew! what is it. Mew, 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 Mew. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, he's a you know he's a he's a nerd like us. He's part of the Nerds International community. He has a 
blog on blogspot.com, thoughtsofabarbarian.blogspot.com. Um, he just ran a Tales from the Loop on the RPG Brewery. So if you guys go out to the... I'll have a, um, I'll have a uh, link to the show notes on that thing. And then he posted his thoughts on running it and what he thought on it. So that's awesome. And, of course, that sweet logo from Stefano, the, the ancient dragon himself. Stuff and Dragon Spawn. Um, yeah. Very cool stuff, man. And he, oh, he's at Twitter at MStark78. All well. right. So find him out there. Great stuff out there. Well done. Okay. Sir. Well, uh, so yeah, other than that, we have no events coming up. Uh, we've got, other than that, you know, one that's only three weeks away. That's right. <laughs> oh, oh, specifically. <laughs> all right, all you nerds out there, we've got. Three hours. Three hundred and I wish we had three hours. Three hundred and ninety seven <laughs> hours. Thirteen minutes until I'm landing in Cleveland on noon on the seventh. So <laughs> and uh, for all the others, it's um sixteen days, thirteen hours. <laughs> sixteen days, man. Two weeks. A little weeks, over two buddy. weeks. A little yeah, over yeah. two weeks. Oh dude, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Good I'm, to see I'm, you I'm... hang out with all those other dorks and nerds and Everybody there. So, yeah, that's going to be in Richfield um, between November 8th and 11th. If you guys haven't heard us mention this yet on the, yeah. on the show, it's not like we've been... Only every episode since April. <laughs> <laughs> Which we got some feedback on that, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, that's all right. All right. Uh, you can contact us, mm-hmm. findingthenarrative at gmail.com. You can talk to me on Facebook at Finding the Narrative. You can get a hold of us on Finding the Narrative inside the Nerds International community on me we mm-hmm. we're still on g plus but nobody's over there it's pretty dead. much the whole the mass exodus occurred i mean you can you can get a hold of us there but uh only until it shuts down i'm i don't check it regularly me neither. Um, um but yeah get a hold of us on me we we have a chat mm-hmm. say hi in the chat um mm-hmm. you'll find the sanity rules over there the insanity rules for genesis yeah. you'll find the uh um show schedule over there exclusively so mm-hmm. and you can listen to us any good place where you've listened to us already uh mm-hmm. including podbean itunes youtube and google play okay. so this is tony saying keep rolling them bones and this is chris saying remember the rule of cool everyone and just have fun good night see ya Finding a Narrative podcast is not affiliated with or endorsed by any companies mentioned on the show. Any of the products mentioned on our show or appear on our website are the property and copyright of their respected owners. All items are used under fair use and educational and review purposes. All other items are the intellectual property of Finding a Narrative podcast. Copyright 2018. All rights reserved.